Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to SciShow Quiz Show, the only quiz show where at six feet tall, I'm the shortest one on stage. Mm -hmm. I'm your host, Michael Aranda, and today we have a tiebreaker, oh. because in 2014, you two faced off wow. and Reed won. Oh my and gosh. then in 2015, you guys faced off and Hank won. I don't remember And anything. today, <laughs> we're gonna, and then we'll never do it again. Best two, two out of three. Today, we are going to break the tie. As a special thank you to our supporters on Patreon, we've selected two of you at random to win the prizes that Hank and Reed will earn for you today. Hank, mm -hmm. you're competing on behalf of Lucia Yates. Hello, Lucia. Reed, you're playing for Bella Nash. Bella Nash, hi, Bella. Or possibly Lucia. Well. Let's with Lucia. Yeah. <laughs> we checked, we checked. <laughs> today, regardless of how Hank and Reed do, both Lucia and Bella will be taking home the signed cards from the final round with our contestants' final guesses and wagers on them. The winner will receive the I won SciShow Quiz Show pin, but the loser will get the ultra rare I lost SciShow Quiz Show pin. And the winner will also take home some secret SciShow swag from DFTBA.com. Back to you. So, both of you start off with 1,000 SciShow bucks. And I'm just gonna leave right now. Yeah, no kidding, actually. <laughs> Probably the best, <laughs> best thing to do. Each time, each time you answer a question correctly, you'll get 100 points. If you answer incorrectly, you'll lose 100 points. Okay. You guys ready for round one? Yes, sir. Round one is about forensics. Okay. There are a lot of ways to identify people besides looking at their DNA. Mm. And for a long time, forensic scientists have used unique patterns in human bodies as conclusive evidence to identify and convict criminals. Mm -hmm. But over the years, scientists have realized that some of these patterns aren't quite as unique as we thought they were. So which of these techniques is no longer considered a reliable way to identify uh -oh. someone? Okay. Is it vein analysis? Oh, weird. Retina scans? Tooth print analysis or fingerprint analysis? I'm gonna go with tooth print analysis, Michael, because that seems pretty arbitrary to me. Well, the table turned green, so <laughs> you are correct. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Every, I mean, sometimes your teeth change, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mine have been floating like around. It's fairly subtle, right? Yeah. Like a subtle thing, whereas right. like veins, you could get like down right, to the little Right, like, right, right. And if, like, I, if I bite you, like, <laughs> like what if I what if I like have like just like I'm like sort of twisting around and doing it a bunch or, or like, have like a you know a corn husk stuck in there in it. Yeah. I mean you husk. never know. <laughs> corn husk killer. For decades, bite mark comparisons have been used to both identify and convict people. It was famously used to convict serial killer Ted Bundy in 1979. But in recent years, investigators have gone back over old cases, often using new technology to analyze DNA evidence. And they're finding that bite mark analysis isn't as reliable as they once thought. Dozens of people who were convicted based on their teeth have now been exonerated. It turns out that it's pretty common for people's teeth to be arranged in similar ways, and it seems like human skin isn't as good as we thought at preserving the shape of bite marks. Vein analysis and retina scans, meanwhile, are still considered reliable ways to identify someone, though they're generally used in security and biometrics rather than in forensic investigation. These techniques involve looking at the unique tangle of blood vessels in a person's forearms and retinas, respectively. Fingerprints are still considered unique, too. Comparisons can be wrong in very rare cases, but that's generally because the computer or person doing the analysis made a mistake. Speaking of fingerprinting, right. even though fingerprints are one of the most useful ways to analyze a crime scene, it's not always easy to see them. So forensic scientists have special techniques to help them develop these so-called latent fingerprints. One method involves a common household item that bonds to the molecules left behind in the fingerprints. Which household item is used to do this? Is it cooking spray, super glue, ammonia, or witch hazel? I'm gonna go for super glue. I was gonna go for super glue too. Dang it! Dang you are it! Correct, sir. Should have hit harder, faster. Yeah, that was in uh, Beverly Hills Cop 2, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> they used those special skills. There are lots of different components to a fingerprint. There's sweat, plus all the stuff in the oils left behind by your fingers. Those oils contain amino acids, and that's where the super glue method comes in handy. Super glue is made of cyanoacrylate, which as you'd probably guess, is very good at bonding to things, including the amino acids and fingerprints. But you can't just smear it onto surfaces and expect fingerprints to show up. To develop fingerprints, investigators set up a little chamber where they boil cyanoacrylate and let the gas surround the object they're trying to get prints from. When the molecules in the gas bond with amino acids, they form a white coating on the fingerprints' ridges. Then, all investigators have to do is take a picture of the developed print. We're moving on to round two, which is about the human body, and the point values have gone from 100 
to 200. All right. Deal. I have one of those. I do too. I know, I like, yeah, I've lived my whole life <laughs> with a human body. Inside a human body. Right here. Yeah. Some of the simplest things to study in genetics are Mendelian traits or characteristics that are controlled by just one gene. A classic example would be eye colors in fruit flies. A fruit fly's eyes will be either black or red, depending on which version of a single gene they have. You'll often hear people talking about examples of Mendelian traits in humans, but mm -hmm. a lot of those examples are actually just myths. We're pretty complicated. Which of the following characteristics in humans is actually controlled by one single gene. Okay. Is it whether you're lactose intolerant, oh. whether you can roll your tongue, mm -hmm. whether your earlobes are attached, or whether you can bend your thumb backwards? I'm gonna go with the earlobes, Michael. Incorrect. Ah! Whoa, ah! Um, ah! What was the first one again? Lactose intolerant, roll I your tongue, I kind of like lactose intolerant. I'm gonna go for lactose intolerant. Okay, you yeah. are correct. Yeah, I'm uh, green. Oh God, I'm so far <laughs> behind now. I'm 400 behind. Uh, yeah, what's the score? 1,300 and 900. Oh. You're doing math this whole time too? Well, <laughs> how can you pay attention to the science. questions if you're doing math at the same time? <laughs> Biologists used to think that attached earlobes, the ability to roll your tongue, and the ability to bend your thumb backwards were all Mendelian traits. But studies have shown that the truth is more complicated than that, and there are more genes involved, no matter what you might have been taught in your introductory biology class. On the other hand, the ability to drink milk as an adult is the result of a single mutation that started around 8,000 years ago in the area we now call Turkey. That mutation was useful because it gave people a new food source, and it spread through the population, so now 35% of humans can drink milk. Okay, our next question. People faint when the blood pressure in their brain gets too low, mm -hmm. and all kinds of conditions can cause this sort of low blood pressure, including things that affect the autonomic nervous system, which helps control things like your heart rate and breathing. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, which of these is not a cause of fainting? Looking at art, <laughs> peeing, taking a cold shower, or brushing your hair? I'm gonna let Reed go first, because I really, I, there's no other way for me to catch up. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go for looking at art. That seems silly to me. That is yeah. incorrect. No. Oh. That's minus 200 points for Reed. All right, well, I wasn't paying attention at all. <laughs> uh, I, I bet it's brushing your hair. Yeah! Oh. So I know it peeing would be one. Uh, yeah. The answer was taking I've, a cold I've, shower. Taking a cold shower, okay. Think, taking a hot shower, I bet, will make you faint sometimes. Could. Because mm. I paint uh, while feeing all the time. <laughs> you, you paint while feeing? Yeah, I get paid to paint. Yep. Fainting from viewing art is a real thing. It's known as Stendhal syndrome, and it's psychosomatic, meaning that the symptoms are influenced by the person's thoughts. When people with Stendhal syndrome see collections of art that they think is beautiful, they experience symptoms like dizziness and disorientation, and they sometimes faint. Fainting during or after urination is known as micturition syncope. It's not totally understood, but it's thought to be caused by a sudden drop in blood pressure, either from standing up to pee after lying down, or from emptying an especially full bladder. Hair grooming syncope is rare and usually affects children. It's thought to happen because the brush or comb is stimulating nerves on the child's head, or because they're positioning their neck in a way that affects their blood vessels, and therefore blood flow to the brain. People do sometimes faint from hot showers, which can lower blood pressure, but cold showers don't do that. So, last question in this section. Yeah. Scientists used to think that humans could only see visible light. That's obviously why they call it visible light. Mm -hmm. But they recently learned that under certain conditions, infrared light can actually trigger the light detecting cells in the human eye. Okay. What are these conditions? When the light beam is very wide, when the light beam is very narrow, when the light includes both infrared and ultraviolet, or when the light comes in short bursts. Yeah, get go for short bursts. Get it wrong. You are Dang correct, it! Sir. Oh my god! I'm not I'm never gonna catch up. You can someday, honey. It's okay. I mean, this is just our tiebreaker, and uh, somebody's getting broke, I'm just saying. Okay, uh, <laughs> I don't wanna. Oh. I'll see you in 2018. <laughs> this phenomenon was actually discovered by accident in 2014. Researchers were working with an infrared laser, and they knew they weren't supposed to be able to see its light, but they sometimes saw flashes of green. So they did what scientists do when they don't understand something. They decided to study it. When they experimented with the laser, they found out that when it sent out pulses of infrared light really close together, it triggered both mouse and human retina cells. Normally, photons of infrared light wouldn't have enough energy to trigger these cells. But the researchers realized that when the pulses were very 
short, the cells would absorb two photons at once, which activated them and sent a signal to the brain. So that's why they were able to see the infrared light. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, I is can, that almost twice I can, as much? I, I can barely. That. That I almost can, twice as much? Okay, good. I can barely catch you. <laughs> you might be able to. I might get it wrong. So at but this I point, catch you. Hank, you have 700 points. Reed, you have 1,300 yes. points. We've reached the point where you guys are going to bet on your answer to the next question. I can tell you that the next question is about materials science. I didn't wait. What is materials? Oh, Sorry. Wait, are we supposed to show what we're betting? No, right? you're not. Okay. <laughs> but I did. While you figure out I'm how you much out. you're going to bet. Materials science? We're going to go to commercial break. Welcome back. <laughs> are you guys ready yes. to hear the question? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Pycrete is mm. a material made out of 14% sawdust mm -hmm. and 86% ice. Oh. It's useful because it melts really slowly mm -hmm. and it's super strong. Mm -hmm. But pycrete was originally invented for a very specific purpose. Ooh. What was it? Preserve food, provide housing during expeditions in Antarctica, build a bridge, or build a boat. Do we just write it down or just say you it? You just write it down. Okay, because I actually know this one. Because <laughs> I am awesome. <laughs> oh, you're not done yet, Hank? Are you not done yet? Because <laughs> I am, because I knew this one. I just, I changed my answer because I think I know what Reed wrote. And if he gets it right, it doesn't matter. So I'm guessing that he's wrong about thinking he's right Fool. and going with another answer. Fool. Well, I know he it was seems, used for this at some point. I don't know if it was the original purpose, to be honest. pretty confident. But now I I've always seem confident. Now I'm don't fake it until you make it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Reveal your answers. Build the houses. Build a boat. It's on a boat. Tell me I'm right. Reed is correct. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Can we get green really quick? Yeah, yeah. That, do you see how green that is? Who's the green brother now, huh? Ooh. Back in World War II, the British Navy wanted to build an unsinkable aircraft carrier, and a man named Geoffrey Pike was looking for innovative ways to do it. A 1,000-ton ship made of ice was built in Canada based on his ideas, and it worked pretty well, but it wasn't quite strong enough. Then Pike came across a report that said ice was stronger when it was mixed with little bits of wood. He started experimenting with combining different proportions of ice and wood, and that's how pycrete was born. The material wasn't too expensive, it was stronger than concrete, it was basically bulletproof, and with a little built-in refrigeration, it wouldn't melt in the ocean. As promising as the project seemed, the Navy never ended up building a pycrete aircraft carrier. There were still some kinks to work out with the design, and the project wasn't a priority. But for a while there, the world almost had a giant ice boat. Well, you beat my zero points. <laughs> I really did. Yeah. By how many exactly, though? Uh, can we just rub it in really quick? 1,401 points. To zero. To zero. Yeah. Oh, God, I can't believe Reed beat me. Uh, I beat twice now? Is that twice? Um, can we yes, get, it's can best two out of three. You are now the best. <laughs> we can all agree. For now. I'll just get you a, a shirt that says the best. Can you really, actually? I'd I'm sure like you already that. have one. I don't, no. no. I, just, I just write it on everything I wear. <laughs> just it helps me keep from being sad. Well, <laughs> and with that, thank you for joining us for this SciShow Quiz Show, and thank you Lucia Yates and Bella Nash for your support on Patreon. And thanks to all of our patrons on Patreon who make this show possible. If you'd like to help us make episodes like this, you can go to patreon.com slash scishow, and don't forget to go to youtube.com slash scishow and subscribe. As a biochemist and a biologist, you probably both know at least a little bit about the subject of our next round. Okay. Carbon. Sure. Okay. Carbine.